Howdy folks! So in front of me today I've got the Techniques SAGX303. This is a stereo receiver from 1991 and I received this in non-working condition and I want to talk about uh, not only the repairs I did to it uh, but mostly the uh, modifications that I want uh, to make to this. And uh, so this receiver is pretty pretty bog standard for the uh, the time period um, it's just composite video pass through, doesn't even have an on-screen display, it's uh, 85 watts per channel and it is stereo, uh, even though it has surround uh, speaker outputs, um, you know, in the early 90s, um, surround was pretty much all uh, generated by a Dolby chip, so there wasn't, there's no way to actually pass uh, surround data into this, so it, as far as I'm concerned, it is a stereo amplifier. And uh, I have a bunch of Techniques amps from around this time period, uh, the one below it, this is my uh, SUV76. This is uh, just this is actually an amplifier, not a receiver. This is from 1988. It's about three years uh, older. And I also have a an SX. Um, it's an SAGX790, which is from '94, about about three years older than this one. And it's also a receiver. Um, so I've got I've got units right around this time period. Uh, but this one, the uh, the GX303, is uh, it's not a great model, um, and it has some. Uh, pretty significant problems. Um, pretty much it has, as far as I'm concerned, two design flaws, which um, either one of them on their own wouldn't be so bad, but together they form a, a truly deadly combination. Uh, deadly for the amplifier, that is. This amplifier is designed uh, like most of the Technics amplifiers from this time period. It's based on a uh, Sanyo uh, integrated hybrid module. Um, some of these people people just call these ICs. I, I, I like to refer to them as hybrids because they, they have a bunch of dyes in them. And I do believe it is a ceramic substrate underneath, at least in some of them they are. Um, I'm not sure about this particular model, but I call these the hybrid modules. And uh, this one has a fan, which um, most of the receivers did. The amplifier, the one below it, does not actually have uh, a fan in it. It's, pa it's fully passively cooled. The entire thing is basically a heat sink. Um, and, you know, it's it's pretty straightforward. It's got some switch pass-through for uh, power, linear power supply, um, and then it's got, uh, you know, a tuner built into this one. Um, you know, it's got a video board and uh, an equalizer, and this is the surround board, so they actually have a separate 10-watt uh, uh, audio output for the, the rear, which, of course, is pretty, pretty useless. This is from the time period, you know, where we have motorized uh, remote control volume um, which is pretty nice. Um, I actually kind of like that a lot. Not only is there the, the coolness factor, but um, you know it, it gives you a truly analog pot, which is nice, so you get the volume controls that you want. You don't have to deal with the discrete steppings. Um, as long as the pot doesn't wear out, uh, you're good. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's got um, through-hole stuff, uh, pretty much all the bottom board, it's single-sided, and then uh, it's got some surface mount stuff on the front board here. It's got two ICs, um, which do uh, the VFD and uh, sort of there's a what they call the microcomputer, um, which just sort of runs the you know the, the display and all the normal functions. And then there's another IC over on the parametric equalizer board, and uh, everything else you know aside from the Dolby whatever um, is all pretty much discrete. One kind of nice thing about this amp is that uh, the vast majority of the components are actually made by Matsushita. Um, all the caps are Matsushita. You know they didn't outsource that stuff. Um, a lot of the integrated circuits are made by them, um, as well as uh, a lot of the passives. So, um, you know, even even the some of the transistors and everything were made uh, by them. So, um, you know, they made the fan, they made everything. Um, you know, they, they hadn't uh, really gone to the uh, the outsourcing uh, of, of parts um, at this time. Uh, obviously, the things like the ICs and, you know, the ICs that they couldn't make, um, you know, they got Sanyo, which, of course, another Japanese manufacturer to do that stuff uh, for them. So... Uh, this is actually, it, it's it's kind of nice, and this has a service manual. Um, it's kind of towards the tail end of service manuals, um, where it's, it's got the, the schematic in it, but not really too much more beyond that. Uh, but that's all you need to uh, repair something like this. So previously, I mentioned that this amp has two design flaws. And uh, I want to go over what those are now, because uh, the rest of this video uh, pretty much hinges on understanding that. So... Um, the first thing has to do with the power supplies in here. Now, this being an audio uh, piece of audio equipment, uh, it's just got a standard linear uh, 60 hertz power transformer, which is center tapped, which comes in through rectifier, and you've got your positive and negative, um, sort of we'll call it B plus, 
uh, which in this case is about 50 volts. Of course, it's unregulated because we have no switching converter in here, so it's going to vary with your mains input voltage. And, uh, you know, that's great for the power output, but of course you've also got to run all the digital logic and everything, which is going to run at lower voltages. Um, and so there's a bunch of other rails in here. And what you would assume is that because you've got this power transformer here, you would just have additional secondary windings, um, which would be, you know, slightly above what rails you need to generate, and then you would use, you know, some form of, uh, you know, linear regulators um, just to clean up, um, you know, those, uh, those different rails. And that's exactly sort of the way I would assume that this would work. But that's not the case. So the output of this uh, transformer, it has two, two windings. One of them is the center tapped um, plus or minus 50 volts. And the other one is a dedicated winding just for the VFD. I don't know why the VFD is so special and that it needs its own winding because the VF VFDs are not high voltage, um, you know, relatively speaking. So I'm not quite sure why they did it that way, um, but that's what they did. So that means that all the other rails are derived from the plus minus 50 volts. And that includes things like plus or minus 5, uh, plus or minus 15, plus or minus 25. That's got a whole bunch of weird voltages and they're not even those, they're not even exactly that. Like the 5 volt rail, it's called 5 volts, but uh, on the schematic even, it's, it's actually a 6.1 volt. Um, so they're all slightly weird, but you get the idea. And so those are all derived from the 50 volt uh, rails. So that means that, and, and of course this is audio stuff, there's no switching regulators. So that means they're using a linear regulator to go from 50 volts to 5 volts. Um, that's a 45 volt drop that they have to do, uh, which means there's a lot of power being dissipated in the linear regulators. And, um, you know, that inherently is not too much of a problem. Um, it's not great design, but it's, it's not so much of a problem uh, by itself because um, the... The, the, there's a bunch of regulators, but the four biggest regulators um, are, uh, the, of course, they're, they're, they're not dedicated like ICs, they're, they're all discrete. So there's actually four series pass transistors in TO220 packages. Um, there's two of them under this clip here and two of them under this clip here, which all go on to this uh, primary heatsink here. And so those, those are uh, the four main ones. There, there are other transistors in here which uh, do other minor rails, but they have a lot less current through them, so they, uh, they aren't heat sunk. And uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of power that's being dissipated, but this heat sink, um, you know, with the aid of the fan here, is entirely capable of dissipating that amount of power. So that's not a big issue, you know. It, it does use, like, 60 watts at idle, you know, with no output um, whatsoever. Um, and uh, that's watts, so it's like 80 to 90 VA um, doing nothing. So, you know, it's not efficient, but that's not the primary problem. Um, you know, that by itself is, is not, uh, not that big of a deal. So the, the second problem, though, uh, has to do with the fan. So this heatsink uh, is not big enough to handle the complete power dissipation um, of this amp uh, passively. So, of course, they've got a little fan in the back here, and uh, that's, of course, used it's, a, it's an exhaust. So the idea is that air comes in through the top uh, fan grill and then gets exhausted out the back. And, of course, they don't want that fan to be on all the time because, of course, it's going to be loud. So the idea is it is controlled and there's a fan control circuit um, which, you know, turns it on and off. This is not a, a speed controllable fan. It's just either on or off. And when I originally started the uh, diagnostics uh, on this amplifier, um, I, didn't, I hadn't gone through the entire schematic yet. And I was just kind of, you know, taking a look around. And one of the things I was looking for was, um, you know, the, the thermistor on the heatsink uh, to detect the temperature. Um, and I couldn't find any, and so then I had to assume, oh, okay, maybe the, you know, the, there's temperature sensing built into this, uh, this hybrid module here, and looking at the schematic, that's not the case. And when I found the fan controller circuit in the schematic, um, my job pretty much just about dropped. The way that they're doing the fan control in this is ass backwards as far as I'm concerned. What they're doing is they're taking the output, and I mean literally the output, the voltage on the speaker terminals, and they're passing it through two transistors to amplify it, and then they're driving the spe they're driving the uh, the fan with that. So uh, basically, the average output voltage has to be above a certain a certain value for the fan to spin, and you know naively this seems reasonable because when the output power is low 
it's not going to be dissipating that much power, the fan doesn't need to be on, and then if you crank the volume up, it's going to be dissipating power, and then the fan turns on. Sounds reasonable, um, but you're, you forget, like, one major problem, and that is these, these series pass transistors are dumping a massive amount of heat, uh, basically a static load, a heat load, into this heatsink at all times, and this heatsink is not capable of dissipating that power um, without airflow. So if you, um, you know, and the thing is, the, the amplitude you have to reach before the fan kicks in is pretty high. And so anytime, anything below that, the fan never turns on. Everything above that, the fan's on. And you can actually get just the right volume where the fan will actually, you know, spin with the beat of the music where you're just at that threshold. And so what this means is if you listen to music at a moderate level, like a sane human being, um, the fan will never spin, and the amplifier will literally cook itself alive. And this is uh, a pretty serious systemic problem with this amplifier and a bunch of other ones from around this time period that Technique's made. Because they all use this same stupid-ass design. It has no thermal, um, no thermal sensing or protection of any kind. Because remember, these are, they're just discrete transistors. They're not ICs, so they have no built-in uh, thermal protection. And uh, so when I actually, uh, you know, sort of near the end of this repair, when I was actually sort of looking, looking this up, I actually found some, you know, some old forum posts where people were, um, you know, were talking about these and, um, you know, they were claiming that uh, these, these transistors would get hot enough sometimes to actually desolder themselves from the circuit board um, around, you know, that's, that's just around 200 degrees Celsius. And honestly, from my experience with this amp, I fully believe that that's, that's real. Um, that's not an exaggeration, because uh, this thing gets absolutely bloody hot. And uh, so, you know, once I fixed this, um, I had to turn my attention to how am I going to prevent this thing from cooking itself again. And you may actually be able to see it. I know the lighting's not that great, because, of course, um, it's, uh, it's nighttime here, and I've only got so much lighting. But around uh, the two regulator sections, specifically this one, um, you might be able to see some discoloration in the board, um, it's quite a bit uh, more visible to my eye than, than what the camera picks up. Um, but this one is the, the highest dissipation regulator, and this one is uh, less so. And so the board is all very discolored around here. And um, that, of course, cooks the capacitors in the area, and it also um, makes the PCB on the bottom side very crispy. And so during the repair, um, there were actually a couple traces that I had to uh, replace with wires on the underside of the board as the, the PCB material had been so baked that it was just crispy um, and the traces were just cracking um, under even the slightest amount of, of pressure or flex. It, uh, it was, was pretty bad. Now, I did replace all of the capacitors in the heat affected zones. I didn't bother to recap the whole thing because these are all Panasonic caps, of course, and they're all, they're all quite good. Um, but there were a couple in the heat affected zones that were out of tolerance. They were quite significantly low. Um, so I just replaced them as a matter of course. Um, I didn't have to replace all of them, but I, I did just because it made sense and capacitors are cheap. Uh, but these are all Matsushita caps. They're all the you know same brand, so I'm keeping keeping with the theme there. And uh, the uh, so other than the the bad traces and some solder joints and and the caps, um, I also had to replace the speaker protect relay here. Um, the relay had been uh, the contacts had been so pitted and destroyed um, that they the it, it had like you know. I think it was above 15k um, closed resistance on the contacts. Um, so I, I, I just once I confirmed the issue, I uh, just replaced it with an Omron relay. Um, nice one should should last quite a while. And also, of course, it's clear, so it's kind of cool. You can see it uh, see it actuating and everything. So um, the other thing that I noticed um, when I was in here is this unit has been repaired before, um, and the repair is obvious. Um, all four of the series pass transistors in these regulators have been replaced. Um, because you can, on the bottom side of the board, it's all clearly wave soldered, except for those four parts. They've got the flux, they've got hand soldering on there. Um, they've all been replaced. And there's also, you know, there's, there's fingerprints on the inside of the case and everything. So someone has been in here at some point and replaced all the regulators. I suspect probably one or more of them died, and they, they replaced all of them as a matter of course. Now, they all are replaced with the original... Uh, Matsushita part number. So um, whoever did this was, you know, either an authorized tech or had access to those parts. Um, you know, it wasn't substituted for something else. Um, I have no no backstory on when that was done, 
but uh, this has been this has melted down at least once before um, and has been repaired. Uh, the original IC is still in here for the the, the uh, power output, which is nice. Um, but uh, yeah, that's uh, that's uh, kind of funky. So anyway, the goal here is to uh, modify this. Um, so that it doesn't melt down again now that it's working. And uh, so obviously I'm not going to keep the original uh, fan controller um, in, in here, and nor am I actually going to keep the original fan. So I did take this apart and clean it. I took everything out of here, cleaned everything, scrubbed all the boards. Um, I, did, I took the whole thing apart. You can take the motor out and everything um, just to make it all look nice. This, is, this thing was quite, quite nasty when I got it. Um, but I'm not going to keep this this uh, original uh, fan just because it's kind of loud and I have better options. And this is part of my alternative cooling solution. These are Noctua Redux fans. Um, I've had these, I didn't buy these for this project, I've had a couple of these sitting around for many years uh, because I originally wanted to use these to uh, use these for my file servers. These are the 80 mil uh, variants, but of course uh, these weren't powerful enough so I just sort of have had these sitting around. And uh, I have four of these, and uh, so the, what's really nice about these is if you actually look at uh, the hole in the rear, this actually fits just perfectly in the back, uh, and the top cover sits on top of this. So that's, that's a perfect fit in there um, uh, for the exhaust. And uh, it also, they also happen to fit pretty well on top of the heatsink, and you can fit two of them side by side, and they cover pretty much the entire uh, top of the heatsink. So because I have four of these, I plan to use three of these uh, in here. Two intakes from the top and one exhaust from the rear. Uh, the exhaust is necessary. Um, you can, you, if you just keep it as a, an open hole, the air, unfortunately, because this is sucking air down, um, it doesn't really end up uh, going out. It kind of just recirculates the same hot air. It doesn't really work too well. Um, so you do need the exhaust. And I thought, well, you know, I could get away with two fans, but uh, because I have these and I'm probably never going to use them again, I'll just uh, put three of them in here because uh, why the hell not, right? So then comes the question, how to control these fans and how to power these fans. Um, so these are 12-volt fans, and you can run them on less than 12 volts if you want, uh, to an extent, uh, DC. Um, but I think 12 volts makes the most sense. Um, that's what they're rated for. And uh, there isn't really any good rail slightly below 12 volts to run these off of. Anyway, I'd have to go all the way down to the 5 volt rail, which I don't really want to do. That's not going to provide enough airflow, in my opinion, uh, for the sort of max load case. Um, so I need to come up with a power supply for this, and I also need a way to uh, control these. Uh, these are, of course, 4-pin fans, so they do have PWM capability. And, of course, I don't want these running at full speed all the time because I don't want to hear them. Um, you know, you can hear these when they're running at full speed, but when they're running nice and slow, you can't hear them, and, um, of course, I want to have some sort of fan controller. And I, I went through and, uh, sort of designed my own fan controller around, uh, you know, an AT Tiny and everything, um, you know, as to how I would do it, but it, it, it's something that, you know, I could easily do, it's just, there's a whole bunch of, you know, software I have to write in testing, and it's like, do I really want to spend the time doing the, uh, doing the actual software work, um, and I thought, you know, someone has to have already made uh, a, PW, a PWM controller um, that's, you know, temperature-based. And uh, as it turns out, uh, there is. And so I bought it, and uh, I wanted to use this as sort of a base. Um, and so this thing, uh, you can get this on eBay, you can get this on Amazon um, for various prices. Um, the one that I got is the ZFC39 V2.0. And... Uh, I've seen some videos of things that look like this, but they work a little differently. I believe mine has a different firmware or is maybe more up to date than uh, some of the the uh, other people who've you know made reviews of this. Um, so uh, just you know, I'm not I'm, my, my goal is not to make a review of this, but uh, just note that this one doesn't behave exactly the way I thought it would, um, and that's actually a good thing. Um, I actually thought I would have to you know, desolder and sort of modify this to make it work the way I want. As it turns out, I don't have to do that. Um, all of my complaints um, were just magically solved by whichever, you know, new firmware version came in the mail. So the way that this works is pretty straightforward. You've just got a, you know, a terminal block for your 12 volts input, some dip switches and pots. And uh, so you've got a little NTC thermistor. This is just a, um, 
the I think it's a 50k uh, thermistor. It comes with one. It's pretty short, but it's good enough for one I'm, I'm using. But obviously, you can make that longer if you wanted. Uh, it comes with this optional piezo buzzer, so it has a, a fan stall alarm that you can enable, but it's also disableable. Uh, and you can also just pull the speaker out if you don't want it. There's a little red LED which indicates that it's on, so that's that's kind of you know whatever. Uh, it's based. The one that I have is based on a little Nuvaton microcontroller. Um, the other ones that I'd seen appeared to be based off of STM8 parts, so uh, this uh, this appears to be uh, slightly different. And it's got three fan headers here. So the the way that the way that in general these work um, is the temperature uh, sensor is used for controlling fan one, and then these two pots here control fixed speeds for um, fans two and three. And that's the way I thought this would work. And since I wanted all of the fans to be at the same speed, I thought I would have to cut some traces and then just, you know, wire the PWM pins in parallel. Well, as it turns out, this one actually has provisioning for that built right in. Um, you can see in between the, uh, the chip and the uh, buzzer here, there are these two sort of interesting looking uh, pads. There's one labeled PF and one labeled SY. And so I've added a solder blob on the SY bridging those two, uh, those two contacts. And when you do that, uh, it runs all three fans uh, at the same PWM as fan one. So that's, that basically does in software exactly what I wanted to do, um, where all three fans are temperature controlled and these two pots do nothing. Um, so that's perfect. Um, the PF actually inverts everything, which is kind of strange, but sure. Um, I guess if you wanted to heat something, maybe you could use that. I don't really understand it. But anyway, the dip switches are all kind of strange. Um, you get to choose the minimum RPM between 20% and uh, 40%. You get to choose the temperature range um, with, with the next two. And there's a little table on the back. So I've set it right now for 35 to 45, but I'm going to uh, have to figure out what temp range I want. That's kind of the only thing that I would like to be able to, you know, change myself. Um, that's, you know, one... Uh, one luxury of writing your own firmware is you get to choose the fan curves. This one, unfortunately, I don't get to do that, but I think this will work just fine. And then the last two just enable the uh, fan stall for uh, the first two uh, fans. Um, there's nothing for the third one. And uh, the, the videos that I saw online, the thing actually made beeping noises when it powered on to tell you that the alarm was active. And I was going to just disable the, fan, the RPM monitor just because of that. I don't want this thing to beep every time I turn the amp on. Uh, but this one doesn't do that. This one um, is completely silent until you stall the fan. So, um, yeah, so this, this firmware is pretty decent. Um, I think I spent, I got this on Amazon Prime, so it was like 12 bucks or whatever, um, Canadian. So it was a... More expensive, you can get them on eBay, but I kind of wanted this relatively quickly. So this is going to be the uh, the thing that I'm going to use to control all these things. Um, but of course, that still leaves how am I going to power it. And so for the power, uh, I'm just going to use a linear regulator. Um, so, you know, sticking, I don't want to put a switching regulator in this. I mean, I have switching regulators that I could use for this. So I have a buck regulator here um, that I could use, you know, these adjustable buck regulators. Um, and this would work perfectly fine. Um, this is based on the, you know, the 2596, but um, I don't want to add a switching regulator in it just because I don't want to kind of, uh, I don't want to introduce a switching regulator in something that has no switching regulators. You know, yeah, it's probably going to be perfectly fine, but, uh, you know, I, I just want to do this in the, the spirit of the 90s. So, um, so I just have a 12-volt fixed output um, LDO here. This one, I think I got this one from JRC. Uh, of course, you're not going to be able to read it through the ESD bag, but this is from Japan Radio Corp. You know, they're kind of not the people you would think of when uh, think of for uh, regulators, but I wanted this one because it uh, has a plastic cover on it, so I don't have to uh, put a mica sheet and a, uh, a washer if I wanted to heat sink it. I think, um, now, I I've done the math. I won't need to heat sink this because these fans at max RPM are 70 milliamps each, so the whole thing's only going to dissipate um, I think I did the math, and if I run this off of the 15-volt rail, because um, there is a 15-volt rail, um, it's only going to dissipate, I think, like 600 milliwatts, and these are, you can dissipate like up to 2 watts, I think, from a TO220 in free air, um, so it should be perfectly fine, but if I have to stick this on a heatsink, I have that completely useless heatsink for the surround, um, and I'm just going to use that because... I'm, of course, it's never going to dissipate any power. Um, and that's actually what I think I'm going to stick this to. It's got some holes, so I'm going to get some standoffs and just stick this onto the surround 
heatsink sort of as a mounting bracket, and that gives me, you know, enough room to jam this into the heatsink, and, uh, you know, the fans will reach, and uh, it, it just so happens that there's a jumper on the PCB which uh, has the 15 volts on it, um, and so just right below that heatsink. So I've just got some, uh, I'm just going to get some perf board. I'm going to put this on it with uh, an input and an output filter cap according to the spec. Actually, I'm just going to put um, some slightly bigger caps because it's what I happen to have. And uh, we're just going to stick that in through here, get all the wiring done, and then I'm going to zip tie these guys down to the heatsink. And I have yet to figure out how I'm going to attach the one to the rear of the case um, because there's no holes, unfortunately. I don't want to drill holes. Um, I, I don't want to do that if I can avoid it. So I'm going to see if I can maybe, I might need to use some adhesive of some kind um, to hold it on there. Um, I haven't quite figured that out yet, but yeah, this uh, that's how I'm going to prevent this thing from completely melting down again. And I've done some testing um, with, uh, with this and uh, everything just sort of running off of uh, external power supplies. And the heatsink is, uh, you know, super cool with uh, two fans. One fan is, uh, it's enough if you run it at full speed, um, but if you PWM one fan down, um, it's uh, you know it has to it clearly has to ramp up. So having two fans, uh, plus you also have the temperature gradient across the heatsink. Um, so having two fans makes it uh, much better. But as soon as you put the lid on, then two fans isn't enough anymore, and you need that third exhaust fan. So I know that I'm doing this way overkill. I could do this with less fans and everything, but. Uh, I thought, you know what, if I'm going to do this, I might as well overdo it so I never have to touch it ever again. And this is the final product. So you can see I've got the two fans on the top, the rear exhaust fan there, I've got the fan controller module, and then my little uh, linear regulator here. And uh, I know this is going to trigger some people with the use of hot glue, but I'm not a mechanical engineer and I couldn't find any standoffs. So I just took some panhead screws here, which are slightly oversized for the holes. It's a big keep out zone, so I have... Uh, no problem running into traces, and then I just hot glue them down to this heatsink here. This heatsink doesn't get hot because this amp module isn't used, and I did the same thing for this. So I've just got the input and the output um, on the regulator, um, which is perfectly fine in free air. And then I've just got the uh, the input uh, to this just soldered down to the 15 volt jumpers down there. And then I've got the three fans um, all connected to this. I've got the uh, little beeper in here because why not? Um, and that's enabled, and it's running on the 20% to 100% mode on the lowest fan uh, profile, but I can still access the dip switches here uh, if I want to change it. And uh, for attaching this, I've just got a zip tie here, which goes in through a hole in the heatsink, another one over here, and then I've got two zip ties that are holding the two fans together. So uh, this thing uh, doesn't move, and uh, that's perfectly fine. And then for the rear one, again, I just went with more hot glue, um, and uh, we're going to see how the hot glue does. Um, Sometimes it fails, and sometimes it works for decades, so we're just going to see how it goes. And uh, yeah, it works perfectly fine, so if I turn it on here, you can see that uh, the fans come on, and uh, the little LED's on, and you can't hear this, they're running uh, very slowly here, so they'll be at 20% uh, PWM, um, so yeah, they're completely silent, uh, you can't hear anything. And uh, obviously I'll put the cover on top, and I'll show you what that looks like. But uh, that's going to wrap it up for this project. And for completeness, this is what it looks like with the top cover on here. Um, so you can see uh, there's about a half centimeter of clearance between the fan grill and uh, the intakes here. Um, so the fact that uh, this grill isn't perfectly centered is not a big deal. There's plenty of uh, room for them to draw in fresh air. And then on the rear side, it's, uh, it's again, it's just, a, just basically just an open hole. Don't stick your finger in there, obviously, but uh, that's not a big deal. And that's it. So uh, if anyone's got one of these sort of period amplifiers and uh, you have you want it to last a long time, I recommend you do something like this to it. Um, you don't have to do it exactly the way I did it, but uh, hopefully this inspires you and uh, and if we see this again, uh, I'll, uh, I'll definitely give an update in, you know, a year's time or so and we'll see how it's fared. Um, but until then, thanks for watching.